Welcome to the Earth's Edge podcast. I'm your host, James McManus. At Earth's Edge, we run guided expeditions with a focus on environmental and cultural sustainability. We created this podcast to share stories from people who have found the outdoors and fallen in love with adventure. Each month, we're giving away one of our summit jackets worth 150 euro. To be in the running, all you need to do is subscribe to our mailing list at earths-edge.com forward slash podcast. There's a link in the show notes. Now for today's guest. So if you, if you do have the simple things, it makes life a lot easier because I might be able to treat you at the next rest stop. But if that's kind of 45 minutes an hour away, you know, those painkillers can be kicking in for you in that time. You're listening to Mark Willis, one of our fantastic expedition doctors. We talk about his time in the army and how that training helped shape him as an expedition medic. Mark also discusses his new position as a tutor on the expedition medicine course at the University of South Wales. He also gives his top tips from a medical perspective on how best to prepare for one of our trips. We start out by discussing how Mark originally wanted to be a physio and then changed his mind and found his passion in expedition medicine. So I came to Manchester to medical school. That was 2008. In my first year, I actually met my now wife, Hannah. She was the year above. So we kind of always had to stay in Manchester unless one of us moved away a year before the other one. We didn't really want a year apart. So we ended up just staying. I found a nice place to live and and we've been here ever since. And I I worked it out the other day. I think I've been up in Manchester now 16 years. Wow. So I went to medical school up here. I did my foundation years here. And then after my foundation years, took a bit of time off, which is when I met you guys. And now I'm I'm back in GP training to finally move up the ladder a bit. I'm always happy to hear doctors who are trained to be GPs. I think it's the way forward. And come here, did you always want to be a doctor growing up? Like, was med- medical school always on your 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 hit list? No, it wasn't. It's it's a bit of a weird one. I've thought about doing quite a few different jobs. I mean, when I was really young, I wanted to be an astronaut, and that's <laughs> kind of still on the list, but a little bit less likely now. And then I wanted to be a vet, and I actually applied to do a physiotherapy degree, and I had a place, but I was always going to take a year out before going to university. And I did some work experience with a physiotherapist in a hospital, and I said to her, I said, look, everyone always talks about the really good parts of a job. They always want to sell it to you. But honestly, what's the worst bit of a job? She said, well, Mark, if I'm honest, it's not very well paid. I thought to myself, well, you know, as long as it's a good job, like you'll make it pay and you'll make it work. So I was like, that's OK. And I said, and is there anything else? And I think she must have just been having a really bad day. And she turned around to me and said, oh, if I'm honest, more often than not, it's just really, really boring. And I was like, hmm boring and poorly paid so I was always going to take the year out and do some traveling and bits and the more I thought about it the more I thought about medicine so I I decided to wait for my grades my grades were good enough to apply Um, so I applied and yep 16 years later I'm still living in the same place I went to university and living a living a great life now because if I hadn't done medicine I wouldn't have met you guys and done half the things or be where I am today so like I guess a lot of people would go straight from school into a career. So how did you like manage to get the work experience position to kind of figure out that physio wasn't for you? What context were you doing that? There was different routes you could apply to different hospitals directly, and they would sort you out with some work experience. Then um, I knew a couple of private physios, and I'd done work with them, and, and that seemed great. But realistically, just like being a doctor, the bulk of your work is kind of public NHS work. And then that's different, very different to private work that you're going to do. So I was, I was very lucky to have the experience and have the chance to realise that maybe this wasn't for me before going too far down that route. Give me the highlights, really, your medical career, man. So medical school was a lot of fun. But whilst I was at medical school, I also joined the Army Reserves and became an officer. I went to Sandhurst in the British military. And that kind of got me into the outdoors a lot. At uni, I mean, I grew up in the outdoors. I did Hadrian's Wall with my parents and my dog when I was 12 years old and, uh, you know, camping trips and things like that. But this kind of really brought me back and how to kind of not just survive, but kind of thrive in difficult environments. And that kind of sowed the seed for expedition and pre-hospital. And it was as I was finishing those two years foundation, 
that I ended up getting in contact with you guys. Yeah, the rest is history, man. Yeah, we'll get on to talk about our trip together in Killy in 2017. But um, yeah. talk to us about your experience as a doctor in the, in the army. What was that like? They found that really fascinating. Like, I never really wanted to go full time because I didn't want to be told what speciality to go into. But I thought about the army reserves and I stayed with them. And I think it gives the best of both worlds. It gives me the opportunity to go on uh, different exercises around the world. And, but it also gives me the flexibility to choose, you know, what career I have and where I'm going to base myself. I spent two months with the Gurkhas in the jungles of Brunei. Wow. Which was tough going. But um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And it opened up my eyes to the doors that can be opened when you are a doctor and you have a medical degree, you don't necessarily have to go down the same route as everyone else. I think a lot of people feel that once you're on the ladder, you don't get off it until you're at the very top. And actually there's some pretty cool ladders just to the left and right of you. And sometimes it's fun to uh, jump off and explore those a little bit. Amazing, man. And do you think your training in the army like is helping with your like kind of day-to-day -day job as a doctor? Yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a there's a degree of organisation, discipline, and, and also the leadership side of things. Um, it definitely plays a role in the standards that you kind of set yourself and that you expect of others, which can be a little bit difficult in some ways because, you know, when other people don't have the high standards that you expect, sometimes uh, that can be a little bit frustrating. You know, you, you want, if you get something done in the army, it's done straight away. Whereas if you request a scan in the NHS and it's not done three days later. That's not too uncommon. Yeah. Uh, so it's just balancing that. But personally, I found it really beneficial. It's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, you just touched on there and going on hiking trips with your with your parents. Like, were you, you were like from an early age, were you an avid adventurer? Like, did you go on mad adventures in the backyard and stuff like that or what? Well, that, well that's it. So um, I was lucky enough to grow up um, in southwest London. There were four children that lived in my small cul-de-sac that they were the same age as me. So summer holidays, weekends and evenings were just spent hours and hours going down to the river, playing football, just exploring uh, all the fields and, and the forests. And it, it was fantastic. It was probably set me off on my, uh, my career for a bit of an adventurous path. Cool. So, Kamir, you and I met on Kilimanjaro back in August 2017. I was the expedition leader and you were the doctor. Talk to me about your memories from that trip, man. It was a great one, wasn't it? Oh, wasn't it great? Wasn't it so good? So we could probably take it a little back a little bit further because that was my first trip. And I found out that I was doing that trip kind of just after the interview uh, when, I, when I came over. And I didn't meet you there because I think you were on another trip. The November 2016, so the November before, I just finished my foundation, my two years compulsory training, and I was about to take a year out. And I remember I determined that I was going to do an expedition. And I, w I went on social media. I found all these expedition companies and I found Earth's Edge. I was like, this looks interesting. They send a doctor on every trip. And I sent an email and I got a response saying, thanks for your interest, but we're not looking at it for anyone at the moment. And I just kind of wrote it off. I didn't expect to hear anything. But you'd also mentioned that we were kind of in the off season in November, which is true. Like nothing really runs apart from Mac and Kagua kind of. November to the spring, doesn't it? And anyway, then I, then I get this email uh, from the office in February saying, oh, do you fancy coming over to Dublin for an interview? And I'm like, yes, this is it. And they were like, yep, do you want to do Kilimanjaro? Jam's uh, the expedition leader. And I was like, oh, okay, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So I remember the, uh, yeah, the training weekend where I met you and Rob, who was uh, assistant guiding get into grips with, with it all and just doing the training hike. And and there was a few groups on the training hike um, so trying to get my head around who was actually coming. It was a great opportunity just to see kind of where everyone's fitness was and also just to get to know them on a personal basis. I mean, it's a long couple of days, which is great because it also means that you do get to speak to every single person on a kind of a one-to-one -one basis. I still remember the summit night just taking one step after another, just not sure whether we'd make the top. And then all of a sudden, you're there at Stella Point and you can you can see a who peak. Just what makes the trip more than anything is the people. Weren't the people just brilliant on that trip? Yeah, big time, man. You could just wake up and be tired from the day before 
and then they start singing and you can't help but join in by the time you know the words on day three or four. And then by the time you finish the song, you're pretty determined that you could run up to the next camp <laughs> and make it to the peak. And it was it was something special. It was brilliant. Yeah, like I had such a great trip as well. Like, I mean, just listen to you talk about it. Like, I know like there are crew out there, they're fantastic and they sing in all the trips, but yeah, I really miss it. But that trip was really special for me because three of my best mates were on that trip. Cormac, like who I know since we were like three or four, he's my first cousin, but we've been going on adventures together like since we were like yay high man we our big passion growing up was trying to dig big pits to get my brother to fall into it and then rob as you <laughs> mentioned he was training like he and i um kayak together back in the day and on like 20 years ago on the nile and the zambezi so i know him ages um cormac's sister ashing was on the trip she came over from yeah. la cormac's wife aideen and well, that's then, it. It was a honeymoon, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. She, she. I think those guys love that, like doing a honeymoon with like sixty other people on a mountain. But uh, yeah, it was cool. And then obviously Paddy, one of my mates from school, like it was, it was cool. Like he, he was just such a huge character. Like great to see yeah. him, man. Train for that trip and it's just so transformative for him. He's like, it was the happiest I've ever seen him at that time. You know, he just absolutely loved it. So uh, well, he didn't, he didn't come home with us, did he? No, he didn't. The fecker, like. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's typical, like, you know, I gave him a super deal on the trip and like, he just caused me the most drama, you know, because like literally the day before we're leaving out, he's like sitting down in the bar, drinking a beer, like smoking a fag. And he's like, can you change my flights? And I'm like, ah, man, come on. Like, you know, you're killing me. You know? So, but uh, yeah, he went on to Zanzibar by himself. For the listeners, like we have a lot of clients to go on to Zanzibar. It's it's usually like super safe and fine. But Paddy like took a bus down from Arusha 10 hours over to Zanzibar. And then he was like by himself drinking loads. And, you know, I think he was telling me someone lost his shoes and this kind of thing. But uh, he was off uh, Earth's Edge time. Like so. So we were I was just providing occasional uh, phone support <laughs> for him. But that's how he rolls. You know, he, he had a great time, you know. Well, he made it home anyway, didn't he? He did. He's alive and well. If anyone's worried about Patrick, he, he's 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 absolutely grand right now, you know. He's still here. And as well, man, Joyce was on that trip. Joyce, yeah. Joyce was on our trip and 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 her mum. Yeah. Uh, it was brilliant because she ended up joining the team, didn't she? Yeah, absolutely, man. Joyce, uh, we I was actually due to hire um somebody, I had hired someone to to do our like customer service and sales, Joyce's role. But they they had to. I got a contact on the mountain. Um, I was touched at the office. She couldn't start for a personal reason. So after the climb, JB or Joyce, she like collared me in the bar, you know, and basically it was like, look, I want that job, you know. So the rest is history. Yeah, she's doing great, man. She's uh, climbed Island Peak since, and she was supposed to be on Elbrus this this summer, but obviously the pandemic got in the way. But yeah, she's she's doing absolutely great. She said to she's say hello to you, isn't she? Yeah. yeah. Super. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. What a what a two week job interview. Yeah, exactly, man. So listen, I, I'd I'd be happy to hire someone who spent time in the mountain. You really get to know someone, you know. Like yeah, there's yeah. no, uh, it's better than any sit down interview for sure. There's no hiding, is there? No, there's not. No, no, no. <laughs> Warts at all. You get to know everybody. And come here. So that was August 2017. Then you you did another trip with us to Everest Base Camp in May 2018. What was that like? It was amazing, and it was so different still. People always ask me, oh, you know, what's better or what's harder? And they're just two completely different trips. Now, I'm a bit of a summit bagger. I love reaching the top of anything and just saying, yep, done it on the way back down now. And obviously, Everest Base Camp, you're kind of walking up to the bottom of another really big hill. And you never actually get to the top unless you pay tens of thousands of uh, US dollars. But Obviously, Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world. Every day you're walking, you, your climate changes, and but you still kind of got this peak that you're just trying to reach. And because it's freestanding, apart from uh, just seeing Meru uh, off to one of the sides, there's nothing really else in the in the distance, is it? It's very it's very flat. But reaching that summit is a fantastic goal. Whereas Everest Base Camp. And every day you're surrounded by kind of six, seven, eight thousand meter peaks. And it's just so surreal. So you're just walking through the Kumbu Valley, aren't you? All the way up to base camp. And then as you get further up, you've got uh, Nupse and Lotse. And then you make it up Kalapata and you can see Everest. And it's just, it's something special. 
yeah one of one of my favorite for for exactly that reason and it and it was kind of on that trip when i i kind of just felt like yeah I need to climb that one I need to climb that one and that's kind of what set me off to to really make sure that that i was doing more it is very different i mean kilimanjaro you're in tents for the whole time whereas every space camp you've got the lovely tea houses they're normally nice and warm food made in a kitchen rather than in a tent but both great quality we even ended up with en suites for a couple of the days in in Namche. The living accommodation was very different, but just both f- fantastic trips, and I'd re- I'd recommend them to anyone. Uh, absolutely love them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know what you're saying about wanting to bike summits. So I get asked quite a lot. You know, people are thinking about Ace, Everest Base Camp, but they're like, oh, I really want to do it to climb a peak. You know, but. I think it's just such a different experience. It's that journey in there and, and meeting the Sherpa and being in a different tea house every night. It's just amazing. And as you said, man, you're surrounded by giant peaks the whole way up. And it just it just like your your bucket list trips get so much longer. So then you went on and you were the later than 2018, you were the expedition medic on one of our best trips, Can You Try Adventure? That is fun. Yeah, <laughs> in November 2019. So how was it, man? It was so different because so many kind of expeditions and trips that I'd done before, they were all hiking up a mountain. And when you reach the top of a mountain, it's all downhill from there, kind of both practically, physically and mentally, isn't it? You've reached a summit, you've reached a goal. Essentially, you're kind of walking back to the airport almost almost from there. And everyone everyone kind of switches off a little bit and starts thinking about home in the in the days prior to actually flying out but the the trekking was first and then we reached the top and even when we get all the way to the bottom we're like guys we're, we're a third of the way through these activities that's amazing for anyone that doesn't know so the kenya try adventure you've got the the trek up to the top of mount kenya um point lalana and then you've got a couple of days cycling and a day of rafting but you start the cycle pretty much from the exit point of mount kenya so although you're, you're at the bottom of the mountain, you're still pretty much higher than every other place in Kenya. So when you get on that bike and you go down the road, you don't have to pedal <laughs> for like the first 5K because you're just putting your hands on the brakes and holding on for dear life. Uh, but it, it was a brilliant trip. And what I didn't realize is that we were staying in uh, Old Pieta, the conservancy. You, you camp in between the cycle days in a safari park yeah and you, and you do a safari as part of the trip as well so all of this I, I was maybe a little bit ignorant to the actual schedule of things because i was just like right we're doing cycling we're doing hiking and we're doing rafting but all these extra things and you're having a beer in the evening and the in the and suddenly you hear a standoff between an elephant and a lion yeah it, it's so surreal but absolutely kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity all Petit is amazing, man, isn't it? Like, you know, people yeah. spend so much money in to see like Rhino and all the, 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 as you said, the big five as well. Like, it's just incredible. And you're, you know, the last time I was there, we were cruising along and we could see the Rhino from from the, the bikes, you know. Lou was telling me an interesting story that you guys had to actually shoo Elephant off your campsite. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so Louise was the expedition guide for, for this amazing trip and pitched up the tents. And then we'd gone on the minibuses to have the safari tour. And as we come back, there's an elephant and like a water buffalo, just like on our campsite, (laughs) just walking in between the tents. So you've got the local guys like beeping on the horn. And there's an elephant just looking at us almost the same. Uh, I'll move when I'm ready. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that was that was mad. Mad. Yeah, I think I think uh, Lou was saying you kind of shooed them off the camp, but I, I'm sure it was like, please move, like whenever you're ready, though. You don't want to piss one of those guys off. Trust but, uh, me, there wasn't too much shooing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a bit. I'm, I'm imagining Lou like chasing an elephant with a bit of wavin pipe in her hand. I don't know if that's actually yeah exactly what happened, but um, yeah, yeah it's such an amazing trip. Happened. So come here, last year then you did Elbrus, one of our tougher climbs, man. You're really kind of yeah. stepping it up. How was that? I really wanted to do it because it was that step up kind of test me both physically, mentally, and it also tests your uh, medical skills. It's very different. It was a, it was the smallest group I'd had, but it was also the most experienced group I had. So everyone had been to altitude um, to some degree. I think everyone had at least been to Kalapata. Most people had done Kili. I think one had done Akinkagura as well. 
So they were all people that had been to altitude and felt pretty comfortable with the side effects that comes with being at altitude as well. So that was quite reassuring. I, I tell everyone that Elbrus was probably my, my most physically demanding, but most medically easy. And I think it was probably medically easy because of the experience that people had had. People don't tend to choose Elbrus as their first trip to altitude. Just knowing what altitude feels like, knowing what kind of a high altitude headache is and and knowing that you you kind of don't sleep as well at altitude um, and, you know, you lose your appetite a little bit. And that these are all normal physiological responses probably made everyone quite well adapted to the to the environment. Yeah, I, d- I did this trip with Mike and we were very close to not summiting because of the weather. So for those that don't know, uh, we have two opportunities to summit in the program and we needed four. And we consequently <laughs> um, scratched our day in St. Petersburg. And on that fourth night, we got the good to go because of the wind. The wind was crazy, kind of 70 plus kilometers an hour, just on this exposed ridge and probably even more on the peaks. But that was a long summit night, but absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, getting to the top. And I think also mentally tough as well, because there's no reference points. Like Everest Base Camp, you can kind of see the the tea houses in the distance. And you know how big a tea house is, so you can kind of judge the distance. Elbrus is just, from when you start the summit night at Advanced Base Camp, it's all snow peaks. And there's nothing to reference by. So this could be kind of two kilometers away, or it could be 200 kilometers away. Yeah. And you just put one foot in front of the other with your ice axe and your crampons, and you just go until you reach the top, and you try and make sure that everyone else reached the top as well. And, and we did. If anyone's looking for kind of a, a step up in physical and mental challenges, that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, I remember actually that trip where you were working with Mike Jones, as you said, he's your expedition leader. But I remember watching your weather and going, oh, this is not looking good, you know, because to be honest, Elbrus, we've had teams go out there and just not get the opportunity to even attempt summit. And it's something that we always try and inform people going out there that like, number one, it's probably 30 to 40 percent tougher from a physical point of view than Kili. And also it's not a very set plan, like a bit like Aconcagua, which is a similar or maybe even slightly harder in some people's minds you know you have to have that little bit of flexibility at the end of the itinerary you may not be summiting on the day that it says on the itinerary yeah like i was impressed it's like kind of a spare summit day and then you guys like pushed it an extra like two nights and had to hightail it to the airport i was like yeah like when i when mike called me he was like this is the plan and i was like oh yeah man go for it like try and make it happen so i was so <laughs> pumped for for everyone to make it like it was great. I think by the end, we were ready to move out of that little tin shack that we'd spent kind of five or six nights in acclimatizing. I mean, acclimatization wise, you couldn't have asked for a better program. We didn't even attempt summit on those uh, first three nights. And on that fourth night, we, we hit it and we we got up to the top and down again. So th- this is all the part of adventure and expeditions. People don't always summit, but sometimes you can learn more about not summiting than actually reaching the top. Yeah, for sure. That's a really good perspective. I I agree. And I think our sport becomes a lot uh, safer when you go out there with the attitude. If the mountain is feeling like it, you know, if it's going to play ball with the weather, it will give you the opportunity to potentially summit. It's when we set a target like, okay, I'm going to climb Elbrus next summer and I'm going to climb it no matter what. And it's you can start making bad decisions. So uh, yeah, it's and it's very humbling, man. If you know, you get out there and you've spent your money and you've done all the training and then it's just like, no, nah, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm closed. Yeah, no one's going up. And Elbrus is like that, you know. If you haven't been out to the Caucasus, um, it's on the border between Russia and Georgia, it's not like, you know, a bad day in Ireland or, or anywhere in, in Britain either, like where you're like, oh, I'll keep going, you know, and you're, it's like when the weather is bad there, it's, it's, it can be biblical, you know, so, and it tends to be like that, man. It's either good weather and it's pretty good or really, really bad one or the other. So, Kamir, what was your toughest moment on an expedition so far? You were saying about Elbrus that it was like physically your most demanding, but from a medic perspective, the easiest one. What would you say if you had to pick a toughest moment, what would that be? As we got up to kind of the west, uh, to the ridge in between the east and the west summit, we dumped our bags and then we started heading up the west summit. 
we had a rest there and I just looked around and everyone was kind of flat on their back. And I knew that we still had kind of a couple of hours to go. And I think, I think there'd probably been a little mental lapse. I think people, when you reach the saddle and you're heading up the West Summit, you think that's the kind of final leg. And while it is the final leg of the ascent, it's still a very long final leg. Mm. People had just kind of thought, oh, well, we're dumping our bags in the saddle now. You know, we must be on the last stretch. And being an expedition doctor that you've really got to try and balance. You can be a big, good doctor, but being a good doctor doesn't always make a good expedition doctor because you need to make sure you're fit enough to do the trip and you're fit enough not to be kind of lagging at the back. And, you know, if, if you can't look after yourself, then you can't look after others on the trip as well. So it's making sure that you kind of, I guess, going back to that army, Bob's that we were talking about earlier, about the leadership and the standards that you set yourself. Um, you want to make sure that, you can look after others because that is why you're, you're employed to be there. And, it, and it's only when you really hit your fatigue that you realise how difficult and important that role can be. And like, what about from a medical perspective? Everest Base Camp, and it wasn't one of our guides. For our Everest Base Camp trip, we were stuck in Lukla for a couple of days because of the cloud and there was no planes going in or out. And the cloud lifted a little bit, but not enough for the aeroplanes. Uh, but we managed to jump on three different helicopters. And I was on the first helicopter. And rather than going all the way back to Kathmandu, it just took us kind of on a 20-minute flight to a lower level uh, where we could then pick up a plane. So the airport that it took us to was essentially just a runway strip. And I get there with the first group of people. And then it goes back to shuttle the other two groups back and forth. And there's a group of guys on the side of this airport there's this old chap and he must have been about 70. He was strapped to what I think was a ladder, but they were using it as a stretcher. And, oh man, he looked sick, super sick. No and way. I've got 20 kgs of med kit with me. I know he's not part of our group. I know I'm not insured to look after him, but can I realistically just leave him there? Because he looked like he was almost dying. So I, I, I speak to one of the guys who's with him. And I find out that he's essentially, he's obstructed his bowel. Uh, so he's blocked his bowel up and he's due to get a flight over to Kathmandu. And so I'm like, okay, this is a bit of an emergency. So I assess him. He, he appears stable, but I, I'm aware that he could like drop off at any point. So I have I have some fluids like in my hand ready to run into his into his veins to keep him going. Some, some painkillers in case it all, in, in case he goes essentially. And then they tell me, oh, well, don't rush because he's getting on your flight. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, great. Um, it's a 40-minute flight from where we landed back to Kathmandu. And this aeroplane, it was even smaller than the ones that we flew into Lukla. It was like one and one. And essentially, so I say to uh, two of the ladies that were on the trip, they were both nurses in the Coast Guard, and I say to them, do you mind sitting at the back? Because if this guy has a cardiac arrest, if he starts dying on this airplane, we're going to need to do something. So anyway, I, it was the longest 40 minutes of my life. And the girls were just looking at me just like, he's not going to make it. So we all get on this plane and they just shove him onto this seat. He's dripping in sweat. He looks grey and he's just moaning in pain. And whilst... All I did was really assess him and keep an eye on his observations. That was probably the most tense I've been about a, a situation on the mountains. A lot of people think that you do expedition medicine and all you do is the really cool emergency stuff. Oh, you save people's lives. Oh, you know, inject them with iron decks to sort out their high altitude cerebral edema. Oh, you sort out their pom edema and you sort out their fluids and everything else. Yes, maybe you would do that like, well, I've never done that, so I'm sure you do that at some point. But actually, bits that you've got to be good at is the common everyday problems. And I think this is why I've gone down the GP route. Whilst, whilst you've got to be great at the emergencies, emergencies don't really occur out of the blue. You don't suddenly turn around, have a cup of tea with someone, and then look and, and suddenly they're in a coma because they've got high-altitude cerebral edema. They start with a niggling headache and then it starts to not go away, and then it gets a bit more severe, and then they're sick. And if you're a GP, I think you can be very good at identifying these kind of everyday problems 
and nipping them in the bud and treating them before they develop into an emergency. So I like to think it's because of my good medical skills that I've not really had an emergency, but maybe I've just been lucky. <laughs> I think so, man. That's an amazing story, man. Jeez, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy that you were there and, and got to treat that guy. And uh, did you ever find out how he got on? He obviously made it to hospital in Kathmandu. We landed in Kathmandu and there was an ambulance waiting for him. Great. And then they just whisked him off and they blue lighted him off to, I guess, the tertiary centre to have surgery. Yeah. Let's take a break there for some quick fire questions. Okay, I'm looking forward, I've been looking forward to this bit. Let's go. Sweet. What was your first job? I worked selling in kitchens and bathrooms in home base. Nice. What song was always on your workout playlist? Oh, uh, Thunderstruck, ACDC. What are you reading right now? I am reading uh, Homo Sapiens. If you were stranded on a mountain with one celebrity, who would it be? I would go with uh, Kenton Cool. What's your favorite food to eat on a mountain? Noodles are good. Noodles are Cooked good. Noodles yeah. are good. Maggie noodles, man, on a high altitude trip are hard to beat, you know. What's your favorite piece of kit? My 8,000 meter boots that keep me nice and warm on 6,000 meter peaks. <laughs> yeah, well, it's forward planning, man. I like, I like the way you're thinking. What's your biggest pet peeve when traveling? People that don't wash their hands and then with good intention, share sweets. I was chatting to someone last week in the podcast, man, and like, we're going to be ace at personal hygiene now after the pandemic. It's... Everyone's going to be on it. I cannot wait. If money wasn't a factor, what would you do all day? Plan expeditions and go on expeditions and climb more mountains. No, no question. Describe yourself in three words. Outgoing, optimistic, and caring. Wicked. That's great, man. Thanks, Mel. So we first started working with doctors um, at Earth's Edge in 2011. And before that, like, well, you have a, a, like a really strong wilderness first aid qualification. You go into a, um, a remote environment with clients. Like, to say when I'm winging it, it is a bit harsh on myself, but like, it's really not your strong point. And to have an expedition leader with you with all the tools that we give you, it's just absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, fair play for looking after that guy. And I totally agree with you, man, on the GP point. I think GPs, in my experience, make the best uh, expedition medics. I'm not going to give away our secret sauce and what we look for in doctors, but uh, GP is definitely uh, high. <laughs> like that is the profession I like the most because, yeah, I mean, it's it's just I I think you touched on a great point there that like for people you know thinking about going and doing their first high altitude trip or or, or climb or trek or whatever it might be. You know, sometimes there's a lot of fear around um, altitude sickness and really, it generally speaking, it comes on so slowly and it's it's quite easy to for, for us with our experience to see it in people. If you're you're chatting and conversing with them for over a number of days, it's quite easy to see a change when they're when they're they're starting to suffer a little bit. It's, it's true. I mean, unless the client's hiding it for some reason, it, it doesn't just pop out of the blue. Absolutely. It's so treatable, isn't it? Everything is so treatable early on and it's just about being open and honest and having that kind of relationship with the guys on the trip yeah i always say to people like if, if you you know if you get a, a any kind of medical problem like anything just let the doctor know quickly it's yeah. like at the start it's really easy for you guys to treat it it's when it's going on for a couple of days i know then suddenly they present with this swollen limb you're like okay it would have been great to show us that a few days ago but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> You touched on it earlier that you, you, you really like to stress um, that people are really good in their hand washing and their hygiene and share, not sharing sweets. Have you any other top tips for someone who's like thinking of doing their first big expedition? What would you what would your message be? I've just written a module for the Expedition Wilderness Medicine uh, Masters from the University of South Wales. And one of the modules was uh, mental and physical preparations for, for expeditions. I think get used to walking what you're going to be walking on a on a trek i mean i remember one particular trip one person had done a lot a lot of training but what they'd done is a lot of weight training and the weight training had made them strong and it made them lose weight so that they were probably physically fitter but what they hadn't done is put the weight on their back and do the hours that we will be doing on the trek and it meant that although they were probably at the peak of their physical fitness 
it wasn't specific to the event. So I think probably tip number one is do training specific to what you're going to be doing. If you're going to do Kenya Tri Adventure, get used to walking with a rucksack with however much weight you're going to be putting on your back for as, as long as you're going to be doing it each day. Get used to, you know, cycling a few hours. And if you're not confident in the water, get some swimming lessons or just exposure to you know flowing water the more training you put in the more you get out of the expedition because you're not focusing on how strenuous an activity is or you're not worried about the demands of an activity you just crack on and do it and you can spend more time just making friends and taking in the view so I think training specifically and when I say put weight on your back I mean you know elbows where you can be carrying up to 20 kg if you've never had weight on your back don't put 20 kilos on your back and go you know start off at 20 percent, so maybe four kilos and just gradually build it up from there you know you don't want an injury you know a lot of people do running and uh, i run as well and i know a lot of the guys in the office do but if you don't like running you don't have to because we're not going to be running on a trek the slowest i've ever walked is on expeditions with earth's edge because the pace is dictated by the altitude, which is then dictated by the local guides. So it's not high pace. It's just about being able to continuously keep going throughout the day. And also kind of multi-day hikes. I mean, a lot of people can do a hike and then feel very stiff and not move kind of the next day. Whereas we're going to be moving for days on end. So just get used to moving and, and just gradually build up that weight. I think that's probably my physical tip. I mean, mental tip is work out why you want to do it there is going to be a time when you find it tough, whether that's kind of when you wake up in the morning in your tent and you just want something different that we don't have on offer to eat, um, whether that's because it's uh, the blazing sun in Africa as you, as you summit, or maybe it's the snow in Africa or Elbrus, or maybe it's the long summit night and you just feel like not giving up. Just think about what made you want to do it in the first time and just kind of tap into that. You know, you're going to do it no matter what, so you might as well enjoy it. Yeah, amazing. And then with regards to medical advice, I think you guys uh, provide a, a great kit list, which includes a few medical bits. My tip is probably make sure that you have those medical bits because it's a lot easier to get paracetamol from your own bag than to find the med kit that might be with a guide somewhere on a different mountain. I'll, I'll have a limited supply, but if 16 people all need paracetamol, that's 32 paracetamol, might not have a whole pack on me. So if you, if you do have the simple things, it makes life a lot easier because I might be able to treat you at the next rest stop. But if that's kind of 45 minutes an hour away, you know, that those painkillers can be kicking in for you in that time. And also just know what the medicines do. I've, I've had a I've had an issue with that. Somebody with diarrhea that was taking laxatives because they thought that they would help with constipation and actually just made things worse. So just just know what you're taking and have it with you. That's that's great, man. There's lots of good tips in there. Your last one is hilarious to me. I had a guy on a trip at me once and he what was he taking? He was taking um like a like a a, a Levalium in the morning to to relax him and then just before we'd start moving, he was taking like Lucas Aid tablets to get himself going again and like you know, taking motilium and um, amodium and lots of different stuff. I think it's so important to to check in with the doctor. So as you said, you we supply our, our expedition medics with a full medical kit, but we ask people to bring a couple of basic bits of medication um, themselves just to have handy. But your your first tip as well, man, about the type of training you're doing, I think weight training can be fantastic to supplement um, car cardio trip to keep you, stop you from getting injured. But, you know, getting out and doing two long days in the hills makes such a difference. And like the training weekend that we run before each trip, the difference um, in preparedness or in how prepared people are if they go to the training weekend and they meet their expedition leader and, and doctor, as opposed to if they don't, like it makes all the difference, you know, just to get feedback on your fitness and how it's going to work. And we look at your equipment, it, it really, really makes a huge difference. Yeah, for sure. It's really good points, man. Thank you. You, you can tell who's putting the effort on the trip from the training weekend you can also just give these little tips you know um like you said about weight training weight training is great but not sole weight training you, you're not going to weight lift in in russia also you do need big enough muscles to get you up and down the mountain so you every, everything in moderation but if you don't know what that moderation is then we can help yeah 
Exactly, yeah. So you mentioned there you started a position uh, on a expedition medicine course in the University of South Wales, man. Thank, uh, congratulations on that. Yeah. Thanks. Tell me a bit about it. It's really exciting. Um, yeah, so, so that's a recent thing. So it's, it's a new course and it's, um, it's distance learning. So it's all online. So you don't need to be near South Wales. Uh, I'm up in Manchester, but I can tutor from up here. And it touches on, it covers six different modules. And I've written a few of the modules because it's a brand new course, just started. As I mentioned, I wrote the module that was uh, physical fitness and mental preparations for expeditions. And I also wrote the module that was health considerations for polar and mountainous regions. Uh, So common conditions like uh, acute mountain sickness, including um, hape and haste and high altitude headache, and then also frostbite and hypothermia as well. Yeah, they liked my work and they offered me a tutoring position. So I'm going to be running the the second module, which is mountain and polar expeditions. So it's a six week module, six different cases. So one a week and within each case there's three different scenarios. So it's almost kind of problem based and experience based learning. So, you know, I'll I'll write a a scenario, you know, maybe I'm, I'm with Earth's Edge, I'm going up Everest base camp. It's a really cold day and, you know, somebody's, taken off their gloves or they've lost a glove and then by the end of the day the the digit is kind of dusky looking in color and then it goes on and then the students will kind of look into cues within the scenario to the workout kind of what they want to be learning so that day so okay they're in a cold out, uh, environment they're in a high altitude environment the dusky film is probably frost nip or frostbite how do we grade it how do we manage it and then by the time that they finished the postgraduate diploma, which is the first 12 months, they've got experience in preparation for expeditions. They've got experience in mountainous polar regions, desert and jungle environments, uh, specific healthcare considerations, and also kind of post-expedition management of uh, of a group and of medical conditions. Then, so it's come at a great time because I just had my first child. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, which means I'm probably not going to be going away as much. Probably going to limit to one trip a year, especially whilst I'm in training, trying to get the time off. But it does mean that I can keep my foot in with the expedition and wilderness medicine side of things, keep up to date with it and just keep things ticking over until the world opens up again. Yeah, the course sounds amazing, man. That's really great. Like it's going to be fantastic to to that you're keeping current and just feeding all that knowledge back in with, with us. I think it's it's really great. Like, I suppose if I was going to ask you what uh, advice you give a doctor who's looking to get into expedition medicine, obviously attend that course, but have you any general tips to... There's two elements to it, being an expedition doctor that I think are really important. you got to be a good doctor because you're the doctor, but you've also got to be comfortable in the environments be mentally comfortable going into the environments that you're being in. Like I said, um, you don't want to get to Kilimanjaro and find that you don't actually enjoy sleeping in tents. You've got to be able to square yourself away and look after yourself because if you can't, then you're not even going to be able to look after others. I mean, I was I was out hiking at the weekend and there was a guide uh, behind me and I just overheard him and it, it's very true. He said... You want somebody that's confident with the route because if they're too bothered about themselves, then they won't be able to be able to look after and guide the other people in the group. It's exactly the same. You need to be able to look after yourself so that you're not even thinking or worrying about yourself. I know military is not for everyone, but if it is, they offer some great opportunities to experience that and you get paid. If you're thinking about it, I just recommend applying because... It is a, it's a fantastic job and I touched on the fact that I wanted to do anaesthetics and the reason I didn't do anaesthetics, I had a job lined up, I had a training job lined up and it was due to start two days before that first Killy trip. No way. Yeah, and then you offered me the Killy trip and I just thought, this isn't going to come up every day. Yeah. And I took the Killy trip and I sacked off the anaesthetics and ended up uh, going the GP route anyway. So, yeah, thanks, Jam. You completely changed my career plan. 
I think that's really good advice for for a doctor, you know, to summarize what you said, like that they're um, comfortable in the environment and they're comfortable being a doctor. But the one thing I would add to that is you, you do have to have a love or, uh, for people because you're 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 on you're on base camp for for 18 days and very little of your time is actually spent doing medicine. Most of the time is trying to build that rapport with clients and having the crack and the chat. So, you know, you build up that relationship. So when they do have an issue medically that they feel comfortable, they can, you know, I can tell Mark about that. He's cool. And, and that's so important, man. I think that's key, especially as you were saying earlier on, to, to, to see a change in people if they are struggling with, with, with AMS or what have you. So, yeah, really good advice there, man. That's absolutely fab. That's, that's a really good point. Um, I don't know whether you remember, we were talking in Dublin Airport just before we went on Killian. Obviously, that was my first trip. And I was, and I was kind of talking to you about, oh, where do you want me in the group when we're hiking? And you just said, look, just be a client until something needs doing or something goes wrong. And that was probably the best advice you ever gave. I, I try and be like a, almost like an assistant guide, obviously give the expedition leader a hand. But essentially, you're just one of the group until they need you mm. and if you can fit in with the group nice and easily and get on with them like you said you know have some banter have a lot of fun with them it does just make things a lot easier you become less of this kind of almost like authoritative figure and it is just someone oh do you mind just having a quick look at this yeah no problem yeah, that's fine or oh, maybe we should do something about this and that kind of goes hand in hand with tackling issues early and quickly yeah Absolutely, man. So true. So, Mark, you are the expedition medic on our Aconcagua trip in January 2021. Has that always been on your bucket list? Uh, yep, that's, uh, that's that's definitely on the list. And yeah, that takes me almost to 7,000 meters, which is the highest I've been. Yeah, definitely, man. You're going to love Aconcagua. It's amazing. We take a really nice route, actually. We come up the Vacus Valley, which is it's a three-day route into base camp rather than two, so it's good for acclimatization, really beautiful. Then we take the ascent up the mountain on that side, and then on the descent, we come back down the normal route. So it's absolutely fab. Like, And uh, Argentinians are great as well, man. At base camp, even though it's 4,000 meters, they, they, they feel it's appropriate to serve everyone a glass of wine with dinner. Yeah, you're right there in Mendoza, so it's like... Malbec capital of the world after the trip so what else are you thinking like after Aconcagua have you got any other big bucket list trips you said mentioned seven summits yeah I fancy doing Kangyatsi with you guys Mira Peak Mira Peak is something an island peak I mean uh, we were talking briefly about not summiting on Everest Base Camp but to do Everest Base Camp and then Island Peak best of both worlds yeah and then we'll just see just see where things take us yeah yeah great man no they're such awesome trips Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate the time and uh, looking forward to getting out in the mountain with you real soon. Uh, you too. See you soon. This podcast was produced by Earth's Edge. We're a small business based in Ireland who organize big adventures all over the world. For more information about us and the trips discussed on this podcast, visit earths-edge.com or follow us on Instagram. Don't forget to sign up to our mailing list to be in the running to win one of our summit jackets. There's a link in the show notes. And while you're there, if you could subscribe and review the podcast, that'd be brilliant. I'm your host, James McManus. Thanks for listening and have a super week.